This summer we're doing The Two Gentlemen of Verona, Hamlet, and Measure for Measure. Um, and roughly, they come from Shakespeare's early writing career, middle career, and late career. So again, and we've done this a number of times, it's three different stages of his writing. With The Two Gentlemen of Verona, um, it's a very early treatment of the kind of comic form um, that he was to perfect throughout his life, um, you know, where he explores this intersection between love and friendship. Hamlet, um, of course, you know, it's his perhaps greatest masterpiece among many great, <laughs> great masterpieces uh, that he wrote. and. Uh, a place so well known that it's tough to talk about it actually. And then we're ending with Measure for Measure, um, a late comedy, a provocative comedy. It's often listed as one of the problem comedies uh, because it fits so uneasily into that genre. Um, but I think a very important, very timely play, um, especially these days, it's important to do it. When you're doing three Shakespeare plays, at the same time, you get kind of a greater insight into the man's mind in the way that he wrote, you know what I mean? Because you, you see how things in one play, you know, how language in one play relates to language in another play. So you get kind of this broader view, which is actually also more specific with you in the long run. Rather than nitpicking and stuff in a way, you just get the greater essence of Shakespeare. It's richer. The stimulus is stimuli, is richer between all of the plays. So instead of being uh, blinded to one story, we have three, and those three stories are richer by the other two, I think, than they would be by themselves. Obviously, each play has is contingent on, on certain leads carrying it. Darko obviously has Hamlet and Claudius and Gertrude to anchor that play down. Um, I've got the four, the four lovers, Proteus, Valentine, Julia, and Sylvia, to anchor that, that play down. And, um, uh, and Paul has uh, Angelo, the Duke, and uh, uh, Isabel to anchor that play down. So we really took our priorities and said exactly what we were looking for in those roles. And, and we looked and, until we found people that could satisfy the doubling that we thought we could, that, that we, that we could do. But what in faith make you from Wittenberg? A truant disposition, good my lord. Oh, now you, your enemies say so, nor shall you do mine ear that violence to make a truster of your own report against yourself. I know you are no truant. I'm playing Hamlet, and I'm playing Lucio in Measure for Measure. He hath picked out a long neglected law under whose heavy sense your brother's life falls into forfeit. We sort of put Hamlet up on a pedestal, but actually, you know, I think we've, uh, the reason why I think the character is so famous is because we've all gone through a lot of what this, this guy is going through. You know, I mean, he's got complex issues with his mother, his father, uh, you know, sort of idealizing his father. He's got complex issues with his girlfriend, you know, his best friend. People are lying to him. Who can he trust? I think we've all experienced these things, you know, and so, it's my biggest research, in fact, for, for Hamlet was the play itself. Rightly to be great is not to stir without great argument, but greatly to find quarrel in the straw when honor's at the stake. A lot of people will say that, that Hamlet is both the clown and the leading man. You know, he's really funny. And he has a lot of fun. Because sometimes we have to have fun and we have to laugh in order to survive these incredible things that are going on in our lives and these sort of torturous things we have to we have to laugh so he uses that a lot as survival and i think lucio is similar because he he uh you know he comes across as funny and not caring and being sort of a jerk but i think he's trying to survive i think he's just trying to get through this life and so he's fantastical and he's huge but then he has these moments where I think there's a lot of pain underneath, you know. So they're sort of similar in, in that regard. Um, physically, they're very different. Like, the way I'm approaching them physically is very different. Um, but that's just because they're different people. There's fennel for you and columbines. There's roof for you. This summer, I'm playing 
uh, Ophelia and Hamlet and Julia and two gentlemen of Verona. What should it be that he respect in her, but I could make respected in myself if this fond love were not a blinded god? I love them both so much, um, and I wish that I could take them both out to dinner, you know? <laughs> They're both such sweet girls, and, and they're so heartfelt. They're so passionate, and they're so loving. Um, but you've got a, a Julia who's, who's so young, really. Her, uh, the way where she starts the play is, um, is very young and, and melodramatic. And then she, as real drama comes into her life, it changes her, and it makes her grow up. And Ophelia is, because of the world she lives in, she's so repressed, and there is no chance for her to, um, to really break out and to discover herself and discover what she's like away from home. There's no hope of that ever for her. Lord, we know what we are, but we know not what we may be. God be at your table. Seat upon her father. Pray you, let's have no words of this. So when they ask you what it means, say this. Tomorrow we face Valentine's Day. All in the morning this time. And I may wish your window to be your Valentine. I'd say my first real step towards building the character is looking at the text. Um, I am very big into looking at the first folio, looking at the shape, where it lies on the page, looking at the beats in the line, um, the actual words that are used, if there's repetition of words, why it's there, uh, the length of words. Um, that's really, the text for me is where I start my process. Why then, we'll make exchange. Here, <laughs> take you this. I'm playing the character of Proteus, and Valentine and I are best friends, and I am obsessed with my newfound notion of love that I just read out of um, the Ovid book that has just come out. When, when the play starts and I have the book and um, I, I become enthralled with this romantic idea of what it means to be a great poetic hero and a great lover um, in sort of the mythological sense of that word. Were not affection chained thy tender days to the sweet glances of thine honored love, I rather would entreat thy company to see the wonders of the world abroad than living dully, flutternized at home, wear out thy idle youth in fair Verona. But since thou lovest, love still, and thrive therein, even as I would when I to love begin. Wilt thou be gone? Uh, I'm playing Valentine. I'm uh, his best friend, and you know, we both start out as his kids and he's found this book about love and and I'm not buying it and so uh, I go off because I, I think in, in my for Valentine his sense is that you know what what a, a, a boy needs to become a man is to see the world and so I go off at the beginning of the play to go see the world so I go to, to uh, Millen when I immediately fall head over heels in love too and so I do a complete 180 in like four scenes and I end up being exactly how he was when, uh, when he left, and uh, he comes, and I want to share all of these things that he was telling me before, and I'm feeling the same thing, man, I'm feeling the same thing, um, only to find out later, uh, you know, I get betrayed by him, my, my best friend in the world. The, the thing that I've set up most in this life, the one true thing that I know is him, and I'm betrayed by him. Never. This service have I done for you, though you respect not all your servant doth, to hazard light and rescue you from them that would have forced your honor and your love? It's interesting because I'll get out of rehearsal for two gents, and then I'll, I'll be on to something, and I'll want to keep working on it, but then I have to go and do a run of Hamlet, and I'm like, 
uh, I, so I'll be, sometimes on stage, I'll catch myself thinking about the other show and... I dare, damnation! To this point I stand, that both the worlds I give to negligence, let come what comes, only I'll be revenged most thoroughly for my father. Good man. I shouldn't be admitting this. And to gents, there are a lot of scenes that I feel like I have to drive, or at least you're pushing forward. And as for ratio, I'm, I'm, save like the first couple scenes, like I'm there for Hamlet. Do you know what I mean? So it, right. it's kind of this gift that I just get to be out there and be, you know. So it, in some ways, it's a, it's a relief. Like in some ways, you have to be more present because you're just kind of like a sounding board. But in some ways, it's like I get to go there and I don't have to decide this is about this today, you know? Because you just roll great. with whatever that yeah, actor is giving yeah. you. Yeah, which, which is how, like, it should be in some other things. Like, you shouldn't <laughs> just be able to roll, but, like, but in this, you really can. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But she, I mean, is promised by her friends. In Two Gentlemen of Verona, I play the Duke. And in Measure for Measure, I play also the Duke, Duke Vincenzio. It's falling, I should wonder at Angelo. In terms of my approach to the Duke in Measure for Measure, uh, so far, it's just been to try and really look at this play and, and figure it out, to ask a lot of questions, because it's a very puzzling character and a, and a puzzling play. Oh, away with him to prison. Where is the provost? Let him speak no more. Away with these chickens, too. Stay, sir. Stay a while. What? Resist? See? Help him, Lucy. Come, oh. sir. Come, sir. Come, sir. So, oh, sir. Why, you bald pig lying oh, 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 oh. You must be hooded, must you? Show your sheep-biting face. <laughs> Will it not? There are a lot of references throughout the course of the play about he's very remote character. The person of the Duke is not well known. He doesn't like to, as he says, stage himself to the public eye. So I think he's introverted and uh, just closed off and trying to figure out who he, he is. And the play begins then, I think, with the, he's come to the moment where he's ready to do something with this person that he's tried to become. There is a lady of Verona here whom I affect, but she is nice and coy and not esteem as my aged eloquence. Now, therefore would I have thee to my tutor, how and which way I may bestow myself to be regarded in her sun-bright eye. In the, in the play of Two Gentlemen of Verona, my character is pretty much a party boy, and um, he has shirked any responsibility to lead in a, in a responsible way at all. And he abuses drugs and alcohol. And it's in some ways quite broad, but I think important in telling the story of um, the necessity for Valentine to step up and actually do something about this. So uh, I get to have fun in Two Gentlemen of Verona and be someone who's pretty much unredeemable and uh, has let things completely slip. No grief did ever come so near thy heart as when thy lady and thy true love died, and on whose grave thou vowedst pure chastity. <laughs> Sir Aglamor. I'm playing uh, Sylvia in Two Gentlemen of Verona, and I'm playing Isabella in Measure for Measure. And uh, I don't think they could be more different. <laughs> Women. Help heaven. Men their creation mar in profiting by them. Nay, call us ten times frail, for we are as soft as our complexions are and credulous to false prints. I think it well. Ideally, you know, I think uh, we want to think of these people as, as us in different circumstances and different times. And, and, um, and so for, uh, for Sylvia, I sort of got a, an idea of the world of the play and what it meant to be in sort of the restoration era and, and the poise and the style and the etiquette and, and all of those things. And, um, and a lot of play. There's a lot of just things happening that I would discover in, in the rehearsal. So it was much more of a hands-on physical sort of uh, attempt than uh, Isabella. Isabella was as well. However, I, I really needed to do my research on uh, on convents, and I went and visited a local convent here um, and talked to some of the nuns there and, uh, and what it meant uh, to be Catholic. I was not raised in, uh, in Catholic formalities and things like that. Look out his eyes! Shut up the to his sight. Oh, and serious world! 
and then I sort of diverged from the whole thing because Isabella is a woman before she's a nun. And so um, just delving into, uh, into that world, you know, the psychological acting part of it. But um, both were, were sort of very different in the research that I did. And, um, and, uh, and yeah, we certainly have a lot of time here, the luxury of a lot of time to prepare. So uh, it, was, uh, it was great to be able to take my time and what I needed to do. Hamlet is the most famous play ever written. So that's what's intimid intimidating about it, is just the fact that it's so well known. Sometimes you feel like, well, people expect to see this, or people expect to see that. And that, I, it's intimidating, and I can't say I like that very much, because the bottom line is, you know, people should come to it with an open mind. Um, so those are the way that, in, you know, so that's one half of the equation. Why is it daunting? On the other half, hand, there's a reason why it's such a popular play, in addition to this extraordinary insight, you know, into the inner life of a character, the most detailed examination of our inner life that there is in Shakespeare, I think. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. You know, it goes so deep into that inner journey. But beyond that, it's a fantastic stage thriller. It's incredibly entertaining, you know. It's wonderfully visceral and bloody and everybody's spying on everybody else throughout. So I think, you know, I really do believe is that you know, the greatness of the play comes on one hand from the richness of thoughts, ideas, language. On the other hand, it's just a bloody good yarn, literally. It's fun. <laughs> Come, sir, to draw to an end with you. Be that you are, that is a woman. If you be more, you're none. If you be one, well expressed by all external warmth. Show it now by putting on the destined livery. I have no tongue but one. <laughs> Gentle, my lord, let me entreat you speak the former language. Plainly conceive, I love you. We call them problem plays because they don't fit into a, the ca com comedy category or the tragedy category or the romance category perfectly. What I think they are, at least the ones I've worked on, this one and All's Well That Ends Well, is that they're beautiful stories, complicated stories, that are a mix of all three of those things. I think written at a time when he, the Shakespeare, was searching closer to the end of his career, the gray areas of life rather than the black and white ones. How's that? Sir, he that drinks all night is hanged times in the morning may sleep the sounder all the next day. No. No. <laughs> oh, look you, sir. Okay, so good. Holy Father, come. Okay, good. Ah, ah. Going well too well. Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> Solicit me no more. What dangerous action stood it next to death would I not undergo for one calm look? Oh, it is a curse in love. Still approved when women cannot love where they're beloved. When Proteus cannot love where he's beloved. Read over thy Julia's heart, thy first best love. For her dear sake thou didst then rend thy face into a thousand oaths. And all the Good, good, good. Corey, you're going to need to end up here. Jack O'Brien came to see uh, my, this production at, uh, when it was running off Broadway at the Acorn Theater. He, after seeing it, he said, uh, I've never seen a play in this play. Um, I've never seen it approached in a way that really makes this story make sense. And I would love if you would continue to develop this idea. Um, let me talk to Darko about bringing it out uh, and giving you uh, open casting and, uh, and, and all of the uh, MFA students to work with. And uh, we've I've cast two, two of the MFAs in uh, lead roles. And they're fantastic. They're phenomenal. Um, as is the, the entire class. Uh, and I now have 21 or 22 actors um, and a dog that is appropriate now for the, for the cast. 
I was sent to deliver him as a present to Mr. Sylvia from my master, and I no sooner came into the dining chamber when he steps me to her trencher and steals her capon's leg. You know, with the cast that's led by Tom Hammond and John McMurtry, uh, who are old Globe veterans, and um, some, uh, as I said, the MFAs, and a couple of new kids out of New York. And it's, they're a phenomenal cast, and I, I couldn't be happier to have the resources to, to work with. Anglemore's in her company. Smack! Anglemore's in her company. Why, then she's fled unto that peasant Valentine, and Anglemore is in her company. <laughs> I pray you stand not to discourse, but mount you presently and meet with me upon the rising of the mountain foot that leads towards Mantua, whither they are fled. Dispatch, sweet gentlemen, and follow me. I think people have an idea that the, the process of doing all of this is much sort of freer and kind of more creative. Um, I think of it as problem solving, like putting together a crossword puzzle. Um, and that's what I really love doing. And I love doing it with the people in the shops. And with, I mean, the intercommunication is why I, I've never really wanted to do film. I've always wanted to do theater because the daily interaction is so energized and so much fun. And it's all about, it's not getting your way or making it so totally specific it has to be this way or that way. It's figuring it out how to use all the pieces and put them together um, in the most productive um, and um, theatrically effective and specific way that you can. And that's what I love about my job both of these shows and the next production I'm doing at another theater in August all had to be designed within three months from the 15th of January until the 15th of March. Is that two months? I put three large Shakespeare's on paper. And that means I capture the images um, but no, it doesn't mean I think through all the details. In many cases, I've had to work so fast that I don't even know necessarily when I'm drawing what the fabrics are going to be, whether it's going to be velvet or satin or anything like that. Often, I know all of that ahead of time, but I had to do so many, so much work all at once on three different, completely different kinds of plays that I caught the images, but then when I came to work, I had a lot of detail resolution to go through uh, in terms of putting the shows into the shops. So I think I had between three and four weeks here in San Diego before the actors turned up just to budget and shop and uh, talk through all the designs that had begin work with the cutters and that was very helpful. Okay, okay, just uh, pan up stage. Yeah, good, and it's a little bit, this is left of center, right? Yeah, so let's just lift it up. It's a little low. You have to be a people person because uh, it's a collaborative art form. Right, a little higher. So you can't get done what you want to do and make happen and put your voice with the piece, A, without getting hired. <laughs> you need someone to want you to do it. Then they put together a whole team of people, and then you have to be able to work well with that team of people to get this. It's a, something that's bigger than any one of us. So although I have a point of view about a piece that needs to be tailored and blended with the other design team members to make it a whole piece. I'm not this one single thing. It's all, it all starts to, to I'm sure you've heard this, it's such a cliche, but, but there's a point where you start forgetting where ideas came from or who they came from and just as whether they work or not. Outdoor spaces are really unique, obviously because of all the, the ambient light and everything else, and it depends on what time you start the show, and then the seasons change, but uh, uh, really it's a fantastic space to be telling these stories, and it is um, what we call kind of a unit set with pieces that come in and out, because we couldn't possibly change all the scenery for every play all the time. And, uh, but there's also, it's a great exercise in making a kind of a, a magical room that can transform. And, one of the things with a design like this is that lighting is one of the key elements that helps it to transform. 
And, uh, uh, and then we simply are telling three great stories. Do you see nothing there? Nothing at all. Yet all that is, I see. Nor did you do nothing here? No. Nothing but ourselves. Oh, look you there. Look how it steals away. My father in his habit as he lived. And hold off for just a second. So we're just going to have to. Just hold there, please. Right. Yeah. So what I'm thinking about is that the light goes out. We tailor the timing and the nuances of it and everything else in the technical rehearsals to the actors and the staging. And sometimes we all get in here and discover we want to do something differently or, oh, what if we used a different entrance, you know, for this one person? And uh, that's, that's, to me, that's the greatest part of the process is it's, it's fun in the beginning and in the middle work is hard work, figuring out the ideas and, and uh, how to do them with the gear you have. Sometimes you have ideas that there's no more space in where you need it to have for it to happen. And so you have to rethink something. And, and, uh, but once you're in the theater painting and rehearsing and taking it in, that's, for a designer, that's the great fun. <laughs> for actors, it can be tough sometimes, I think. But. Let's maybe rack this open a little bit right here, the bottom of it, or side, bottom side. Yeah, don't hit the mirror, but do this. Yeah, okay, and pull it out a little bit. Going out. Yeah, a little more. Yeah, okay, good, that's it. Good, thank you. What's next? I think there's often a barrier to Shakespeare that seems like, oh, it's erudite and too too scholarly but it never is once you really crack it he, the things he's saying to me are always very human very accessible situations and full of passion and things that anyone can hook into so i i love to do shakespeare and pretty much take the chance to do any interesting shakespeare role yeah you know looking at the three plays together something that they share that they have in common even though the tone goes from very very serious tragic <laughs> violent in some instances to light and funny and charming but nevertheless i think all three of them have to do uh, largely with this notion of what is it to act well in the world <laughs>